For the sermon today, we will continue in Peter's first letter. Now we are to the point where we're in the third chapter, starting at the 18th verse. If you're following in your pew Bibles, it begins on page 1890. First Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 18. Listen for the word of God. For Christ died for sins, once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. So when I was growing up in Texas, um, there were not, especially where I was in rural East Texas, there were not many Presbyterian churches. And I grew up Methodist, and there were not many Methodist churches. Where we were in Texas in particular, um, there were basically only two kinds of Christians. There were Baptists, and there were others. (laughs) And that's about it. There, it, there, and, and so I bring all that up just basically to say when we were young uh, kids, the, our youth group options were very limited and it usually ended up we gathered together at a Baptist church. Now since that time, I have come to um, know and even love and appreciate good historic Baptist theology. But those days in the, in the youth group, the Baptist church wasn't exactly putting forward its best theologian. Um, I remember these youth group sermons, the youth minister would preach almost the exact same sermon, some sort of variation of the exact same sermon. It would always end in this way with the youth minister snapping his finger like this. And he said at the end of his sermon, if you knew all of a sudden that your heart would stop, do you know for sure that you would not go to hell? And then he would proceed to say, you can know that for sure tonight if you come down and and pray this prayer with us. And here's my major problem with what happened there. Every time he would preach that sermon, every night it would be the exact same students who would come forward with tears in their eyes. The same ones, night after night. They were aware of their sin and they were afraid of damnation because of this sermon that had been preached. The Baptist youth minister, for all his good intentions, uh, failed in one really important way. He failed to remain, to remind the faithful of of the assurance that they have in the cross of Jesus Christ. Verse 18 says that Jesus died once for all our sins, the righteous as the perfect and final substitute for the unrighteous. You don't need to come to the altar again and again and again because Jesus went to the cross once. Once and for all for you. And who would say that that's not enough? Who would say that's not enough? Now, maybe, maybe you even came today and, and you're feeling spiritually shaky. You're, you're afraid of the judgment of God. And if that's you today, simply ask this question. Do I love and trust Jesus? Do I love and trust Jesus? And if the answer is yes, then cast out that fear from yourself by saying, yes, my sin is great, but his sacrifice on my behalf is even greater, far greater, in fact. His death won my pardon, and it's enough. Look what Peter continues to write in verses 19 and 20. Through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison who disobeyed long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. So what does Peter mean when he writes about these spirits in prison and Jesus who goes to make proclamation to these spirits in prison? This is a notoriously difficult verse to interpret. Uh, the interpretations vary widely, and most of the uh, most honest commentators uh, just sort of stay away from it. In fact, Martin Luther, the, the father of the Protestant Reformation, said about this verse, quote, I still don't know what the apostle means, end quote. Luther had no idea what he was talking about. Calvin wasn't much better. Calvin, unconvincingly, in my opinion, argues that what these verses refer to are Jesus going and, um, and, and going to reclaim the souls of the faithful people of the Old Testament. I don't think that's the case, first of all, because the word spirits in this verse, spirits in the New Testament never refers to people, unless it's attached to something else, like spirits of the righteous. 
It, it never refers to human beings when it sits alone as it does in this verse. Secondly, the Greek word that's used here is not that Jesus went to preach the gospel. There's a, there's a special word for preach the gospel, and it's not used here. This is a, a different Greek word. It's ekerukin. It's a word that's used to make a formal announcement or uh, maybe a, a, a general at a battlefield making a, a, a decree or a command. It's not to preach the gospel. It's a different sort of proclamation. So I'll give you what I think. <laughs> I have this notoriously difficult verse to interpret. Here's what John Flug thinks. Genesis 6 tells us that in the days of Noah, the sons of God, which is a term that can, be, that can mean angels, and I think it does here. In Genesis 6, the sons of God, the angels, took the daughters of men to be their wives. These are disobedient and fallen angels who at the beckoning of their master, Satan, contributed to the corruption of human beings, so much so that God decided to flood the world. I believe these are the spirits in prison who are disobedient in the days of Noah that Peter writes about in verse 19 and 20. But even if I'm correct, even if I'm right about this, there's still the so what factor. Who cares if, if Jesus goes to proclaim to the demons? What does it matter to us? Well, here's why it matters. The proclamation that Jesus makes is not to go and preach the gospel to these fallen angels, these demons. He's going to announce his defeat of them, his ultimate victory over them. He's going to um, proclaim that he won, that he's won. And, and we need, know that this is a, a, a proclamation that needs to be made because from the very beginning, Satan has waged war against God. In the garden, Satan tried to corrupt Adam and Eve, the image bearers of God. And that corruption continued in the days of Noah when the fallen angels uh, came into the, the, the women and, and created a whole corrupt generation of human beings. That, that battle continued in the days of Jesus. We see that Jesus' ministry, he went, everywhere he went, he was casting out demons. And then until at last, with his, with his final and his greatest weapon, Satan enters into Judas, the betrayer, and he had the Son of God executed crucified was it enough did satan win no no he didn't resurrected and alive in the spirit jesus proclaims to the enemy their defeat look at verse 22 it says that all angels and authorities and powers have been subjected to jesus angels are included in there see that They've all been subjected to Jesus through his death and his resurrection. Jesus has won victory forever. And the reward, the prize of his victory, he's given to you. When Satan or his minions tempt you, say to him, you are nothing more than a bitter and defeated enemy. And any way that you might lead me to a loss can never undo the victory that Christ has won over you. You miserable, warped angel. Your destruction is, com is as complete as my salvation. And verse 21 shows us how we can have that sort of confidence in our salvation. Let's read what verse 21 and 22 say then. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. There are two dangers that we have to avoid whenever we think about baptism. I hope you do think about baptism sometimes. And when you do think about it, there are two dangers to avoid. The first danger is to think that baptism is merely a symbol, and therefore it doesn't really matter if you're baptized or not. According to this verse, that is absolutely wrong. It says, this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you. It now saves you. That's a big deal. Unfortunately, our own denomination has fallen victim to this error. The Presbyterian Church USA now welcomes people who are not baptized, therefore, understand, therefore have no outward evidence of salvation, welcomes people who are not baptized to the communion table of the church. It's an unfortunate and a serious error. I believe that the communion table, the communion sacrament matters. That it's a table, listen, it's not just a, any old table, it's not your dinner table at home. 
It is a table of the saved people of God. And we learn from this verse that baptism now saves you. We cannot just say, oh, come to the table. It doesn't matter if you're baptized or not, because baptism does matter. It matters. It is a a means of God's grace. It is the instrument that God uses to save his people. Just as in the days of Noah, he used the flood to save his people from that wicked generation. Now, if you've not been baptized, you might be wondering, you might be sitting out there in the pew wondering, well, since I'm not baptized, does that mean I should not take communion? Let me suggest that there's a better question to ask. What's to keep you from being baptized? I think that's the better question. Baptism does really matter, but there is a second error, an equally dangerous error that we need to avoid, and and that is thinking that baptism is the only thing that matters. Uh, This is actually the error of the Roman Catholic Church, and it's why, uh, if you ever encounter Catholics, um, maybe at a NICU, a, a, a little baby emergency place, they'll often have priests in there coming to baptize the babies, to make sure they get baptized, just in case they might die. Because they believe that if those babies died, then that baptism, the act itself, would have saved them. But we know that this is an error and it's wrong because of what Peter writes here. It's not the removal of the dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. So it's not the outward thing that we do. It's, It's the outward thing that we do is a response to what God has done inwardly in us. Now, the the act of baptism should never be separated from faith in Jesus Christ, but it's not the act that saves. It's faith in Jesus Christ. God won't save you just because you got water splashed on you. (laughs) Water came down in the days of Noah, came down on everybody, but only eight were saved. Likewise, there are many people who will find in eternity that their baptism is no security at all for them because it was never in their life united to faith. Now, baptism is a great gift for us. It really is. It's a great gift for us when we're able to avoid these two errors because there are dark times in our life when we may wonder, I trust in Jesus, but I've done so much wrong. How can I know that that God loves me? And here's how. Remember your baptism. Remember that you were baptized in the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Ghost. It's a promise from God that He will not break, that you have been washed in the blood of His Son, and therefore you belong to Him and you are beloved by Him. All of that is in that promise of baptism. Let's see what Peter writes beginning in the fourth chapter then. Therefore, since Christ suffered in His body... Arm yourselves with the same attitude, because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. As a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. In, this, in these verses, we're told that we are to arm ourselves with the same attitude that Christ had. What is that attitude? What's the attitude that Christ had? It was a willingness to die, if it be the will of God. There was an evangelist who was, who was trying to win souls over, and he was trying to do so in a bar. He went to a bar, and uh, he stood up in that, on that bar, and he began to preach. And he says, the Bible says that if you are a drunkard, you will uh, you'll end up in hell, but you have another way. If you will trust in Jesus Christ, if you will stand up here with me now, then you can go to heaven. Gentlemen, put your beers down and stand up with me now. And there were many men in the bar who put their beers down and they stood up there with the evangelist. But there was one young man who sat at the bar stubbornly with his beer. And the evangelist looked down at him and said, young man, what's wrong with you? Don't you want to go to heaven? And the young man looked up at him and he said, well, yes, sir, I do. But I thought you were rounding up a group to go right now. (laughs) See, the truth is, we should be excited to go right now. We really should. If we are so excited and so ready and so itching to be in heaven with our Lord, then it becomes easy for us to live the way we ought to now. Someone wants to persecute me? Okay. Imprison me? Fine. Execute me? Go for it. 
because in just a moment I will be in glory with my heavenly Father and this won't matter a bit. You see the way it changes the way we live now when we're excited, itching, ready to be there. Are you ready to die? If you knew for sure that, that God was calling you to go and start a church in North Korea, if you knew for sure that God was calling you to go and evangelize in Iran, where those actions will certainly result in your being executed, but you know that God wants you to go do that, would you? Would you? May, may the Lord make us ready to say, yes, Lord, send me. But now what maybe should be an easier question, if you knew for sure that the Lord wanted you to share the saving gospel message with your neighbor here, would you? Well, we've got news. God certainly does want that of you. Arm yourselves with the same attitude as Christ. 1 Peter um, 4, verses 3 and 4 then. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They think it's strange that you don't plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation, and they heap abuse on you. I don't know how many of you are out there living the wild life, and I won't ask for a show of hands, but here's what I do now. What I see of you is what you want me to see of you. And that's to some extent true of me too. So on Sunday mornings, you dress nice. You don't put on your shabby clothes, you put on your nice clothes, don't you? And when you come to committee meetings, if you're involved in the church, then you put your best foot forward. If, you, if I ever come over to your house, you know usually in advance, I'll try not to bump into you, uh, surprise you. So if you know in advance I'm coming, you can I don't know, put away the ashtrays and the beer bongs, I guess. <laughs> you see whatever you want me to see of you. And so I don't know, may, I hope and pray that none of you are living that wild life, but if you are, let me ask you a question. If you're living that wild life, have you had enough? Have you had enough of it already? That's what verses three and four teach us, that there comes a point where we've had enough. Well, what really happens is you realize that everything that the world can offer you is never enough. That's really what happens. It's just one more, and, and that one more is never enough. One more beer is never enough. One more night with one more woman is never enough. One more hit, one more pill. It'll never be enough. And Peter says at some point you get tired of trying to make that enough. And you turn to Jesus, who has always been all satisfying. So how about it? Have you had enough? Let's read what he writes then in verses 5 and 6, the last verses we'll look at today. But they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached, even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to men in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. Here, Peter draws our attention to what happens to faithful people in their death. Well, he's not talking about unfaithful. He's talking about faithful people when they die. What happens? Well, they're judged according to men in regard to the body. That means they die. That means death. The penalty for sin is death. And every human being alike, whether you're Christian or not Christian, every human being will pay that penalty of death because all have sinned. We will all die. But the good news raises this question. Is that all you want from life? Is that all you want? How many of you think, well, I'll live the way that I want to and I'll, I'll do whatever I feel is right and then um, I'll just try not to think about death until it comes. But, but then when it comes, it's terrifying to know that you have to stand before an eternal God and, and judge and answer for all the shameful things that you've thought, all the sh shameful things that you've said, all the shameful things that you have done. And you're not going to be proud of that in that moment. You're going, to, you're going to be terrified, in fact, knowing that he's a righteous judge. Even apart from the judgment of God, though, uh, even apart from the judgment of God, if you could, you'd go back and change certain aspects of your life, wouldn't you? 
goodness, I, most of you have lived more life than I have, and I know I would go back and change certain aspects of my life. We will all be judged in the flesh for those things that we've done. And that judgment is death. But, but, but don't you want more than just a life of, of selfish shame that ends in death? You can try and continue to fool yourself, but don't let it ever be said that you didn't hear it from this pulpit, that, that, you, that you can pursue a life of, of pleasure and comfort and have it end in anything except, ironically, uncomfortable and miserable death. There is something more, though, if you want it. If you're tired of living the way that you have been, it is an eternal life of comfort and joy. And it's found only in Jesus Christ. He paid the price for your sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, and the price is paid in full. Nothing more to add to it. If you decide to trust him and follow him today, he will change the way that you live. He will. You'll stop living for your family because, and I'm not saying this just to be morbid, just to be honest instead, one day they are all going to die, just like you and I will. You'll stop living for money because when you're judged in the flesh, no amount of money will be able to buy you a pardon from that death. You'll stop living for pleasure. After all, what corpse can feel pleasure? And that's what happens in a life that pursues pleasure. It ends up as a corpse. Jesus changes the way you live because he's better. He's better. He's better than your earthly family who will all die and leave you because he loves you more and he can never die and will never leave you. He's better than all the fortunes in all the world. Listen, why would you spend your life pursuing a fortune that you may or may not ever obtain and even if you do, you can't spend it after you're dead? Why do that when Jesus offers himself to you today? His riches are available to you this very moment. All of the riches of Christ. If you'll only trust him enough to follow him instead. The problem is not, this is always amazing to me to think about. The problem is not that we want pleasure too much. The problem is that we don't want pleasure enough. The problem is that we settle for the pleasures of this world and those things never settle us. They're never enough. We are never bold enough to say to God, God, I am tired of not being satisfied in the pleasures of this world. I'm tired of it. Give me a pleasure that will satisfy me. And then, and then to listen to Jesus who says, I am. I am the pleasure that satisfies. He's more beautiful than a thousand of the most beautiful sunsets. He is a million times more radiant than the sun. He is more comfortable than the feeling of being home with family. He is more satisfying than every Thanksgiving meal you will ever eat combined. He is everything, everything that is good or beautiful or worthy. And to have him is worth everything. All, all the, the price that you pay, the small price that you pay to have his life forever is your life right now. It's not really to quit doing what you want to do in life. It's to change what you want in life. To change it so that, that you want Him. And then when the judgment comes, though you are judged in the flesh as men, you may live in the Spirit according to God. Amen.